Create in me a clean heart and purify me. Create in me a clean heart so I... Uh, the next session is called Repentance and Forgiveness. Uh, and it's also going to be looking at the cast origins of our uh, di discontents as well. Our panel leader is Arcandria uh, uh, Owens, Dr. Arcandria Owens, or, or, or Dr. Candy Owens. Um, she's a licensed uh, psychologist and the associate director of the Student Counseling Center at Rose College in Memphis, Tennessee. Her doctoral work focuses on African-American psychology, uh, specifically African-American male experience and the impact of race-related stress, hypermasculinity, and sexuality on identity development. Along with her engagement in training and supervising, uh, Dr. Owens works in private practice and is a racial equity consultant. Dr. Owens is also the founder and curator of Healing Black Narratives, an initiative begun on Instagram to make uh, the work that she does inside the therapy room towards healing racial trauma more accessible uh, to others. Um, Dr. Owens has just been a joy to know over these last couple of years uh, and the work that she's doing is just uh, phenomenal. And every time uh, she's on this panel, I know something good is coming. I know it's something that's gonna uh, feed the soul. And so we're excited to turn it over to you, Dr. Owens. Awesome, thank you so much for that introduction, Byron. And um, the, the feeling is mutual, the admiration and respect is mutual. So I hope you know that too. Um, we are so excited to be here with you all um, and to, to be finishing up this, this long day of um, understanding the root of racism and, and the many impacts of that. And so I'm looking forward to, to what um, our panel discussants will be sharing. We will also, uh, we'll be talking about repentance and forgiveness, uh, which I think is something that is important to be thinking about um, and considering in the context of uh, our current context, as well as historical traumas and intergenerational trauma. And so um, we will be uh, using the context of, of CAST by Isabel Wilkerson, uh, but we know that the content has been very well uh, disseminated by Don McLaughlin earlier today. And so that is not our, um, our desire to kind of go back through that again. It's our desire to really um, hold that as a context um, from which we start to talk about repentance and forgiveness. Uh, and so my, my hope is that you all will um, hear the, the voices that will be sharing about that. Um, and hopefully there will be something in it that you also can glean and, and take back with you and start to understand what is my journey towards repentance, towards forgiveness, when we start to talk about systemic racism, white supremacy, racial trauma, white rage, and black rage and all of the things. Uh, so we wanna start with uh, an introduction of our panelists. And so we will start uh, with Greg Taylor um, and they will each give you just a, a little bit of um, discussion about who they are. Hi, my name is Greg Taylor. I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm a minister with the Journey Church. Uh, I've been with that church about 15 years and have recently stepped down from that church, and I'll get more into that later. Um, but I live in Tulsa, where the site of the worst case of racist, uh, white terrorism, violence in U.S. history occurred in 1921. And I'm doing doctoral research on white supremacy, and specifically this history in Tulsa of the race massacre. Um, a lot going on even today, uh, this week, uh, there has been mass grave discovered. Um, we've become one of the first cities in America that has uh, begun to exhume bodies from racial violence in this way. But we're also the first city to, uh, for the city to take up the Black Lives Matter that was painted on the very street where those mobs gathered and began to um, uh, take the lives of up to 300 people on that day in 1921. And so I'm doing research on that, and uh, I'll talk more about that hopefully in this, this session. Um, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Arcandria. Thank you. Appreciate that introduction. Um, 
Darren, would you mind going next? Yeah. My name is Darren Haygood. Um, I'm a minister at Long Beach Church of Christ out of Long Beach, California. Um, the son of Rudy and Oshiri Haygood, um, responsible for uh, so much of who I am. Um, and married to Gloria Haygood. Uh, this is my wife, uh, who also has an MDiv from ACU and is doing work in chaplaincy. I work at Long Beach Church of Christ, and I would say I spend a lot of my time kind of sitting with the question of what does it mean for the church to be a space of healing. Um, and I only mention that here because I have the honor of being in a panel moderated uh, by Dr. Owens. Um, and she had a presentation that I was able to see probably a year and a half ago that just changed my life um, in terms of what does it mean to listen to someone speak about God and speak about love in such a transformative way? Um, and I don't think I've ever shared that with her, but it's really changed the trajectory of um, how I do ministry and how I think about church as not being this place where uh, we just come together for this formalized experience, but really able to experience uh, the love uh, and the healing of God. Uh, so I'm honored to be here and to share in this conversation. Thank you, um, <laughs> Darren. I'm glad you're here and also feeling very touched um, by what you just said. So no, you had not shared that with me and, and now I'm, I'm crying about it. So I appreciate you a lot. Um, Marty, would you mind going next? And then um, Dr. Draper. I'm Marty Stanley. I'm one of the pastors at Norwalk Christian Church in Norwalk, Iowa, a suburb of Des Moines. Um, I uh, have a bachelor's from Lipscomb University, a uh, master's uh, there from ACU. Um, grew up uh, Church of Christ, so right there alongside a lot of you. Um, and have made my way uh, into disciples and uh, really, I find all of the whole caste system very difficult. Um, I think it's difficult for everyone, but I, I look at it and think, um, get confused as to what it is that I should be doing and how to, to do something as, as one person and uh, realizing that that's not how I should be looking at it as one person, but we should be looking at it collectively together um, but at the same time, it's, um, it baffles me, even our own topic for this panel, um, forgiveness, repentance, reparations, um, none of it will ever be enough. Nothing that we do, I feel, will ever be enough. Um, what we discussed all day today is humanity at its worst is what I feel. And I don't know how we can ever try to forgive with that and offer enough reparations to where things are ever okay. Um, and so this topic, um, I feel will be very hard for, for us to discuss, but I also feel that it's needed for us to discuss how hard of a topic it is and put voice to that, uh, that people don't often put voice to. And that is important to me. And so um, that's why I'm, I'm here. I think I'm next. I'm Ralph Draper and uh, I live here in Houston, Texas. I uh, spent most of my uh, life so far uh, in both uh, ministry, church ministry largely, and uh, also in education uh, as a teacher and a administrator and finally a superintendent and retired from, from education about six years ago, still involved in ministry serving as one of the pastors here in Houston at the Trinity Gardens Church. I uh, have really wrestled with this notion or subject of forgiveness in my ministry, both personally as I've 
dealt with the trauma of my own life and uh, as a servant of the Lord, helping people through through their trauma. So it's it's been something I've had a lot of interest in for a lot of years. And and even in the context of this discussion, after uh, uh, reading the book, uh, wrestling with the kind of the distinction between repentance and forgiveness. And, and I often find myself less stressed about the plight of our world or the plight of our nation in particular, and more stressed about the plight of of our church and, and the role that we play both as a corporate body and how that corporate body impacts my role as a, as an individual citizen in this nation. And, and, and so I often think about it in, in terms of our ability to respond to uh, our, our context in the, in the corporate church and how that's lived out. One of the things I appreciated about something that Don said today when he talked about uh, some of the establishments that he did business with and when he realized that they were really being promoted, but really promoting a dominant society, a dominant culture, then there was action that he could take as a Christian. And I kind of think from, from my standpoint, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. How does the corporate relationship in the church move me as a Christian in a nation that belongs to, to Satan? How do I become that light? How do I become that salt that Jesus spoke of and uh, make the difference? So I, 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 I look forward to this conversation, look forward to uh, Dr. Owen leading us through this conversation and reflecting on some of the things that I heard earlier and uh, some of my own personal trauma and drama. So thank you. Thank you for those introductions. Um, I, I hope y'all can already see and feel uh, what's going to happen here. Um, I think the biggest thing that I'm taking away from from this and um, from those introductions, even and, and what I want to invite us into, is that you know our panelists are saying that they're grappling with this, they're in process around this, um, and I think that that is beautiful. <laughs> I think we need to struggle with this. I mean, I think we do need to, to understand where we are, what to do, how to go forward, um, because this is a common question. Where do we even start? Like, what, what do we even do? Um, and I don't believe that there's a perfect answer to that. And I believe that just as um, building the caste system was messy um, and imperfect and atrocious in all sorts of ways, I think also the path to recovery is gonna mirror some of that too. Um, and so we, we need to embody that. We need to model that um, for one another as well. And so we'll also be seeing some of that. So let's, let's get started. Um, so, you know, we're going to be talking about repentance and forgiveness, and we've also added as a panel reparations as well, because we think that that is a, a vital part um, of this conversation. So we'll start with repentance and, and we'll move as far as we can get here in this hour. Uh, so on repentance, you know, we two, there's two requisites, prerequisites, let me try that again, of repentance. Um, it's to turn away from evil and to turn towards good. So this is most often been and seen in the Bible is turning away from idols, uh, practices that are not of God, and from offensive offenses that were oppressive towards others, and subsequently turning towards God after that. So confession is also a necessary component of repentance we find out in the Bible as well, as it allows for one to receive atonement and forgiveness. The Bible describes two main ways that repentance is manifested, uh, through cultic and ritual paths, which are inclusive of public expressions of confession, fasting, displays of godly sorrow, liturgies, um, and days meant as times of repentance, and then also through a change in how one relates to God, uh, which was generally initiated after an encounter with a prophet uh, who conveyed a message that someone was out of alignment with God. So we see these examples of, of repentance throughout. So repentance includes godly sorrow, um, it includes being deeply grieved and being deeply apologetic for the wrong committed. This necessitates a willingness to be impacted not only by, not only through one's ears, but with one's entire self, the mind, the body, the spirit. 
um, by truth that is spoken about being misaligned or even wildly off course in who God is calling us to be. So in order to repent, one has to be aware of what they are needing to turn away from. Um, and so in the book, in, in Isabel Wilkerson, Wilkerson's book, she, she says these things when she's talking about <clears throat> the building of the caste system. She says, what the colonists created was an extreme form of slavery that existed nowhere else in the world, wrote the legal historian Ariella J. Gross. For the first time in history, one category of humanity was ruled out of the human race and into a separate subgroup that was to remain enslaved for generations in perpetuity. The institution of slavery was, for a quarter millennium, the conversion of human beings into currency, into machines who existed solely for the profit of their owners, to be worked as long as the owners desired, who had no rights over their bodies or their loved ones, who could be mortgaged, bred, won in a bet, given as a wedding presents, bequeathed to heirs, sold away from spouses or children to cover an owner's debt or to spite a rival or to settle an estate. They were regularly whipped, raped, branded, and subjected to any whim or distemper of the people who owned them. Some were castrated or endured other tortures too grisly for these pages. Tortures that the Geneva Conventions would have banned as war crimes had the conventions applied to people of African descent on this soil. Theirs was a living death passed down for 12 generations. So when thinking about, and these, this is the beginning of our questions for our panelists. So when thinking about suggestions to just get over racism, to submit to the idea that we are a post-racial society and to not bring up race, particularly in the church because it is divisive and we should all just learn to love each other. What is the responsibility of the church in naming racism, white supremacy and caste and in facilitating repentance in its membership within the communities and in other spheres of influence? So anyone who would want to start, um, there's also the sub questions of what are suggested ways to go about this and how does the conversation even start? I'll go ahead and start. Um, yeah. Then maybe the rest can just talk the rest of the time. I'm just kidding. But uh, yeah, it's still going on is, is the thing. Like it's not that you're getting over it, that it's been in the past, that it's all settled. It's, it's still in existence. It's still going on today. That I think is one of the hardest parts of this whole forgiveness aspect of it is that it's not something that has stopped. It's something that's continuing that we see every day that people experience every day on a very personal and real level. And in our churches, this is continuing on. I, I grew up born and raised in the state of Alabama, and I was not taught most of the history that was in this book that Wilkerson displayed so beautifully. She just laid it out, and you weren't even realizing how much you were learning as you were flipping the pages. It's still going on. Ruby Bridges turned 66 this year. We don't realize that that was only 60 years ago that, you know, in the state of Louisiana, a school started to, to no longer be segregated. Um, we don't often look at these things. I, as a white person, did not grow up ever looking at these things. I remember, you know, having a really close black friend and we swam together. And I remember people thinking that I was gross because we used the same hairbrush, you know, but yet at the same time, I didn't understand it. It didn't really click with me until I got older. And then when I did get older and I actually started thinking, we need to do something about this, then People were like, okay, uh, you're white. You need to just start talking with all of your white friends. And so we started talking with our white friends about racism, which seems really odd, I understand, but it was actually really good at the same time because 
several of us white clergy would get together and we learned what redlining was because we hadn't a clue. We learned to look for food deserts and realize what neighborhoods grocery stores with fresh produce weren't available in. We started looking at all of these things about how people didn't have housing options, but in certain neighborhoods to get loans. We started realizing that, you know, interstates, when they got put in, go right through, went, were built right in the middle of those black communities that were the strongest so that they would separate them. You know, we started looking at all of this and thinking, what is it that we can do? And we started having a, here in Des Moines, the first Sunday of every month, a, a small a con service of confession. And we wear these shirts and we hold these signs that say, I confess, and it has a blank that you fill in each month. And I pray so you can confess to injustice or ignorance or racism, and you can pray for equality, you know, whatever it is. And we do it at a public place each month. And yet I still, two years later, don't feel like that is anything. And so you sit there and you're looking at things and my hometown of Tuscaloosa, Alabama in 2011 had a huge tornado that wiped through and they totally redrew the school district lines. The high school that I graduated from is now 99.9% .9 black. And the people of the city allowed that to happen. This is what is hard for me when I sit there and look at what it is, what kind of injustice is around me, and yet I don't know where to start. Uh, I think Ralph is speaking, but you're, you're muted on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I just want to speak into this as well, especially this notion of repentance, because I think one of the one of the first things is the acknowledgement of, 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 of our sins as a church in particular. And, and I think that we have to realize in many ways when it comes to the issue of racism, not only has the church failed, but but we've often failed miserably in terms of the world leading us instead of us leading the world. So, I, and, and many of our institutions, both, both in terms of congregations and in terms of college and, 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 and schools, you know, I, I listened to someone mention graduated from Liston, which is where I also got my bachelor's and I, I sit on the board now of ACU. So we had to think about the institutions uh, that we currently have among us and how many of them in terms of their origin derive at in, in terms of this context of racism in our nation and so uh, until we begin to peel back and expose that and, and confess that and acknowledge that we have failed to lead now again i go back to that notion that jesus says you're you talking to his disciples that you are supposed to be that city on the hill you're supposed to be the salt that preserves the world so we're supposed to be leading uh instead of following and, and even when you start talking about integration for example in in the late 50s early 60s when when universities and colleges started integrating we were among the last and we be and even when you talk about integration at the k-12 through system uh many of our Christian schools that exist at that level grew out of this effort to avoid forced integration. So until we begin to acknowledge the, the sins, we can't even talk about the repentance or the grief until we begin to acknowledge as a corporate body and then ask ourselves the question, even among our tradition, uh, when you talk about the Stone Campbell heritage, uh, how, how much has that whole structure been based on or rooted in a system of racism even the even the divides that we had in the early 1900s that we sometimes attribute to instrumental music and other issues but how much of that grew out of this issue of racism so i think acknowledgement confession 
uh, uh, as she just mentioned, is a starting place to, to, to really be honest about who we are as the, as the body of Christ in our heritage, who we are, how did we get here? And then we can start talking about it, it produces that, that, that grief. It produces that, that horror that we have allowed this to become who we are. And, and we can begin to move in uh, a better direction. But I think a, a big part of it is to truly acknowledge, just like our nation, but I'm speaking more specifically of the church, but just like our nation, until we acknowledge that we were built on this, it's, it's, in, it's in our DNA. It's in the foundation of who we are as a fellowship. We, we can't even begin to move in a better direction. Yeah, thank you, Brother Draper. And I don't want to add to that, but um, at James Baldwin, this reminds me of this quote, James Baldwin um, said this 50 years ago, that until white Americans press beyond this epic identity of innocence, the nation will never be healed. And you hear it from the top levels of government uh, just this week, uh, a man claiming to be the most racist person in the room speaking to a black moderator um, and the denial uh, by, by white people that racism even exists. And I think as church leaders, when we do not address racism from the pulpit, we do a great disservice because it's at the depths of the human soul. And what, where white supremacy comes from systemically and is mantled in me as a white person needs to be wrestled with. And until we, um, white people um, and all people, wrestle with how racism, white supremacy is mantled in us and what it does to us, and how I think, as Dr. Burton mentioned, is a demonic. It's from the, the evil one, and it must be spoken about in the most, uh, the most, I think, potent terms that if this is a demonic evil that has been perpetrated for 500 years, this white supremacy and systemic injustice, then it must be exercised by the Holy Spirit. It must be exercised, but not overly spiritualized to where it, it takes it out of the realm of the real and the concrete of how the injustices do real harm to people in the body, to the bodies of black people, people of color. And so, I think for me, I had to learn. Uh, so I'll just narrow that down to one of the things I believe I need to do is to learn how white supremacy is mantled in me in order to learn how to dismantle it. And so I had to learn, I'm learning over the last few years, the specific narrative of the story of the race massacre in Tulsa in 1921 and telling that story to white people. But there's resistance. People don't want to hear it. White people don't want to be made to feel like they're, they're guilty for something that they didn't do. It's a, it's a great uh, example that um, uh, Don McLaughlin gave this morning about the house, that we live in this house that has, uh, has rot and mold and mildew and, and rotting beams, and we have to do something about it. Maybe we didn't set the foundation, but we've got to do something about this house. And um, to me, I think it's, it's incumbent upon white people to be part of this conversation um, and um, learn about the history and the narratives in our specific cities and states in our country, and then learn what we are going to do to start dismantling the white theology, as James Cone would call it, in us that, that helps to uphold and has upheld uh, white supremacy. Dr. Owens? Um, the, the way that I would answer the question, just to start with my own experience, um, as I said, I'm a minister out in Long Beach, California. Uh, I started about two and a half years ago, um, or two years ago, I'm sorry. And in my, my first three months into the position uh, as the minister here at the congregation, um, a woman came and asked to use the church building for a funeral service for her father. 
Um, and as the lead minister, part of my job description is doing the funeral services. Um, but all of these are supposed to be run through uh, the secretary who was working at the time. So our secretary told the woman there was a fee for using the building for non-members. Um, that, you know, if you weren't a part of this congregation at one point or baptized here, there was a fee for you to have the funeral there. The woman responded by saying that her father was baptized in our church, uh, her father who passed away and attended our congregation for a period of time. Our secretary never heard of the person, so she went to look up some information about them. And upon inquiring some other members who had been there for some time, she found that it was true that this person was a part of our congregation and baptized at the church. Uh, but she also found out that the man, her father, uh, was a proud racist and hung the Confederate flag at his home um, and was proud of the legacy of the Confederacy, um, even out here in California. And doing what she thought was best, she arranged for someone else to lead the funeral service and she proceeded to arrange that without conversing with me about it. Now, of course, she did this out of care for me, is what she expressed to me. Um, she's old enough to be my grandmother and she thought, I don't want to subject, you know, Darren to such an occasion. Um, and probably, you know, there's some other layers to this, me being black and she being white, me being the lead minister and her being the secretary um, and the layers that come with that. Um, and maybe her wanted to shield me from these conflicts. Um, but I was bothered by it beyond the personal layers. Um, and it really, for weeks, if not months after, and even to uh, reading this book, uh, the question that lingered with me was why did a proud racist, a proud Confederate flag waving white man feel as though he could be baptized at this church? attend our church and continue to be a proud racist, a proud Confederate flag waving supporter of Confederate beliefs. And then his children feel like they could come and have the funeral here for him. Like, how did that even happen? Um, if he was a, a non-heterosexual member of the congregation, the church would have shunned him while he was alive and maybe not allowed him to be baptized. If he was in the middle of a divorce, he may have been pulled to the side and had some conversation about how uh, Jesus calls us to live in terms of marriage. If he was a Black Panther, he might have never been baptized or even evangelized to. Uh, but somehow the church did not see his racism or his support for such a hateful and dehumanizing regime as being at all in conflict with his baptism nor in conflict with their expectations of their members. So to the question, where does this conversation start? For me, I believe it starts at baptism, at our membership classes for church. As we know in Galatians, Paul challenged Peter to his face for Jewish supremacy and said in Galatians that it was an entirely different gospel a heresy. It is not a small sin or just something that the older generation wrestles with and will fade away. It is heresy of the highest level. Ephesians says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. So to go into the baptismal waters as a proud racist and supporter of the Confederacy and to live that way is to deny the divinely endowed humanity in another person. And if a church is not naming it, is not engaging in unmasking the caste system, is not facilitating repentance, for me at least, uh, it's, it's not a church. You know, at best it's a, a country club, but it's really, it's not a congregation. This is not a spiritual place. This is something different. And it, it doesn't deserve to even be graced with that title. So that's not a part of our teaching at the fundamental level when people are entering into our congregations. Then we need to go by a different name. This is not Christianity. This is a different gospel. So 
That's how I don't see. Let me piggyback just a little bit on that, what, especially the reference to Galatians, because I think that's a that's a great parallel to what we're dealing with even today when you talk about Jewish supremacy that existed in the church for a long time. And uh, uh, even among the apostles, apostles who, 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 if you will, opened up the doors of the church. So you had this existing and Paul is observing this and it, it would have been quite easy for him to just pretend he doesn't know this. I mean, no, no one could say he, he, this is all internal. So he could simply pretend not to notice what Peter is up to, but he chooses not to because he's trying to stamp out this notion of white supremacy, uh, uh, excuse me, of Jewish supremacy. So I think that when we talk about the, the, the possibility of what do we do in our fellowship, we have to start by not pretending not to know these things exist, not pretending or ignoring the foundation, and I want to get back to that, the foundation that we're sitting on in the American Campbell Stone movement, that we're sitting on a foundation and we're still living, the, 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 the example that Don gave and that was referenced earlier, we're still living on that foundation. And we're, and, and we're trying to somehow fix the house without fixing the foundation. And I think that we've got to deal with the fact that our, our structure, our institutions, many of them take root in this whole notion of white supremacy. And, and, and like Paul, I think we gotta call it when we see it. I think we've got to have the courage, the conviction where we are in our locality to be that light in a very dark place, in a very dark moment. I do think sometimes it's tempting to, to think, okay, you know, these folk are not even Christian, but but the truth is they are. Christians can be racist. I know that sounds like a contradiction of terms, but Christians can be racist. Christians can be hateful. Christians can be as the church in Corinth. It could be a mess. And so the Lord depends on those of us who whose hearts are tugged by the Holy Spirit to, to begin to be that, that salt or that light or just that ray that begins to change that local group right there where we are. And, and the more that we're doing that as individuals, and we then begin to see that as congregations, that's how that light begins to spread. And, and we begin to really get to a place where we can, where we can move uh, and, and get to repentance. But we have to also acknowledge that the church can be that way and still be the church. It, it's a mess. It seems contradictory. It seems counterintuitive, but you had apostles who stood on Pentecost, who really still lived with a sense of supremacy over the Gentiles and had to be called out in their, in, in their own actions. Yes, I, I really appreciate where this is, this is going. And, and I wanna, you know, just add, um, add to the discussion because, you know, we're, we're talking a little bit about repentance and, and even how to create the, the needed prerequisites to even start to move down a, a path towards repentance. But this other part, you know, is, is on forgiveness as well. Um, and so I wanted to just ask the panelists, uh, you know, I, I was going to read one of the stories um, from Isabel Wilkerson, um, but because of time, I want to maybe just name it. Uh, but when we look at forgiveness too, we, we have to understand what what needs to be forgiven too. Um, and and I, I do believe that that needs to come from uh, the people who have been slighted, who have, who have um, been hurt, who have been harmed, who have been traumatized. Um, but also I do believe that, that that has to come from dominant caste people too. How can they forgive themselves? How can they start to move um, <clears throat> in such a way that they start uh, forgiving themselves so they can be open to actually doing the work of, of moving forward and changing uh, and then, you know, also dealing with reparation. So when a concept like forgiveness is, is brought up alongside countless stories um, about domestic terrorism, about lynchings, about um, you know, educational system, policing systems um, that are that are sick, that are that are disordered. Um, 
I, I wanted to ask the panelists, what does forgiveness even look like in the face of these ongoing traumas? Because Marty, you shared, like, this is not just a historical thing that's happened. This is ongoing um, slights, ongoing life and death situations that are impacting us. And then also can repentance and forgiveness even happen while the caste system is still in place? I think that's a great question, that last one, Candy. And I know uh, Darren mentioned that when we were prepping for this panel group. I, I think that was that question that Darren asked that you just did, uh, can it even exist while this is still going, uh, was the most impactful for me when I was thinking about this. Um, and I, I've come to the conclusion that I really hope it does because I think the more people change, the more people that are educated, the more people that realize we have to be the change that we're waiting for, then that's when all of this can slowly, unfortunately slowly come about that people can uh, receive some form of forgiveness that they can, receive the apologies that are needed that um, me as a white person, I, I feel very unequipped here because I know that I benefit from the caste system and for better or worse, I always have. Um, and I know it's for worse, um, but what is it, I think our, our question is, and I know Travis uh, and Claire have already commented on it in the chat, what is it that we can do actively to bring about, uh, is it that we have these discussions, more discussions with more people on what our history actually has entailed and why it is that the system is set up the way that it is so that then people are, are then educated to where they have that confession in them, have that lament, um, are in need of that forgiveness, um, that repentance uh, that then brings about action. What is it that we can do that can change the entire caste system, that systemic system that unfortunately I think our foundations are built upon? Um, as it relates to forgiveness and just reflecting on the question that you had posed, Candy, um, I think for me to ask for forgiveness without repentance or reparations is to declare yourself as my enemy or minimally not my family. Um, and just to clarify, if you are my enemy, I'm still committed. Um, I'm really hoping Darren comes back. Yeah, I wanna hear that for sure. Um, we'll give him just a moment maybe to get back on. Um, Greg or our brother Draper, would, would you, either of you want to step in? Uh, I, I will, um, excuse me. Okay, yes, uh, when I think this notion of forgiveness, I, I think of it kind of in, in, in two ways, because I was thinking about the, you know, the response when Bolton's younger brother of the uh, police officer in in Dallas, and and the response that 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 he, he received from that, or the response that people had to that, because you know seeking forgiveness and offering forgiveness. So I see it from two sides. You know, those who have 
committed to sin are, are seeking God's forgiveness. And, I'll, and, and, and for me, and, and, and people may differ with this notion, but it's always about seeking God's forgiveness because ultimately that's who we sin against. It's kind of like the prodigal son when he says to his father, I've sinned against heaven and against thee. Now, certainly it's a sin against me, but God has, the way, I think the way I, 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 I avoid becoming a victim is that I don't have to deal with in terms of forgiving, I'm talking about the person forgiving. I'm switching sides here. The, the way I, I, I avoid becoming a victim to, to needing you to do something so I can I can feel better or I can be better. I, I, I can deal with God. I can forgive. I can forgive you. Now, whether or not you can be forgiven is an issue again with you and God. There, there's this triangle. It's not a it's not a it's not a horizontal relationship just between you and me. There is this triangle relationship that God stands in the middle of, calls, calls me who, have, who, who has been acted against to seek, to offer forgiveness through him. And that at the same time, that's why I say I relate this to my personal drama. I grew up with my dad who was an alcoholic and what we would describe as a dysfunctional family. And so I grew up with a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness, needing my father to do some things so that I could be okay, needing him to overcome his addiction, needing him to realize how painful he had made my life and the life of my mother and the life of my siblings. And as long as I, as long as I sought forgiveness, forgiving him directly without God being in it, I was unsuccessful. And I had to turn to God, which then took took my father's control of me out of the picture. On the same hand, God dealt with my father in terms of moving him to a place where he could work through if he chose to. And so I, I agree with Darren that a person certainly could choose to not, and I think oftentimes that's the case, people have not uh, sought forgiveness and that they continue to operate as our enemy, much as Saul, Saul did against David. So. But how do I avoid becoming a victim to your refusal to respond to something that, that I need? That, that's kind of what I'm getting at, both sides of this coin. How do I avoid becoming a victim of waiting on you to do the right thing? And if I'm angry and not ready to receive you when you want to do the right thing, how do you avoid getting locked into that? I, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, Dr. Draper, maybe um, I'll, I'll respond to that and say that um, as a white person, I have to listen to the stories of the, the hundreds of years and ongoing suffering of Black people and, and be moved by that. I agree. I agree. And I think one of the things that has been so much a part of the white experiences apathy toward the suffering of black people from the time of slavery to Jim Crow days to lynchings to these massacres that I'm researching in Tulsa to uh, the ongoing uh, mass incarceration um, disproportionate incar incarceration of people of color the injustices that continue today with police violence I mean on and on it goes and white people continually deny the inequities, deny the suffering, deny how black people are affected. And so I have to hear those stories, but it's not a black person's job to tell me how, it, it, for me as a white person to continually ask, well, what do you want me to do? White people that are on this, this uh, in this conference, it is not black people's job to, to help us learn what we are, are called by God to figure out in our heart and souls to do. We, we should listen and we should be a part of these conversations, but to continually go back and say, please forgive me, show me what to do, teach me about racism. And that's not that's not the job of, of people of color to Amen. show us. Amen. Amen. So, you know, we as white people really have to engage this in ways like we never have before. I have to commit as a white person to engage in embarrassment, shame, um, that is a tiny fraction of what any 
black person has to experience on a daily basis and on a regular basis um, to expose my own heart and expose my own um, white supremacy that has been mantled in my life and has brought me, as uh, Marty Stanley mentioned, all the those benefits that we we have um, really uh, had as as privileges, and not just privileges, but um, that have come at the cost of the lives of others. And so, um, one of the ways that that those stories and narratives have moved me is to really do something and stop waiting. For, we've had failures of the judicial system, the legislative system to do reparation in in city of Tulsa. I mean, there not only was there a massacre, but then there were court cases that, that blocked the uh, insurance, um, the, the payments of, of any insurance um, claims by businesses and homes. There were 1,256 homes burned down in one day, more than 100 businesses, a dozen churches. The courts went forward in blocking any kind of insurance payments and has continued for 100 years to block the development. And the Black community in Tulsa, for its part, has, with 10 times less resources, done very well with a lot of agency and power. Um, and yet, I've been moved by the story and those narratives to do something and not wait any longer for the government and, and right. for the church and for me to engage in. Uh, my background is uh, my dad was a home builder. And so I mentioned earlier, I stepped down from uh, being the pastor of, of my church or preacher of our church in order to work with um, uh, Brother Blakeney in North Peoria Church of Christ. I've been in conversation with Dr. Jerry, Jerry Taylor about um, some of the historic ideas around housing and trying to address in North Tulsa the inequities in housing. And so um, have started a, a movement to rebuild those homes that were burned down in one day, those 1,256 homes. And um, even though many, uh, much of North Tulsa has been rebuilt, um, that hasn't been repaired by white people. And so I believe that white people should be a part of that reparation in the next 10 years. Thank you for, for all of that. And um, I'm glad to say Darren is back. And so I, I feel like you were about to share something that uh, we needed to hear and maybe the, the enemy got upset. So come on back in, Darren, we'd love to hear that. And I really appreciated uh, what's been shared thus far. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't I think my Wi-Fi went down at the house. So I'm sorry about that. Um, we moved into a different space. Um, so answering the question concerning forgiveness, um, I was trying to say that to ask for forgiveness without repentance or reparations is to declare yourself as my enemy or minimally not my family. Um, and still being bound to Jesus's call to love enemies. Um, but I think it's important to understand that these are two separate categories of engagement. Um, only my enemy or someone who is not my family wants forgiveness without desiring my healing or my reparations. Um, it is to declare that our destinies are not bound to each other that my healing and repair is a separate and even an opposing interest to your healing and existence. So for me, forgiveness is reserved for family members, biological or spiritual. It can only happen in the space of equity, justice, and shared destiny. I think um, the, the writer, Isabel Wilkerson, uh, she symbolizes it best when she talked about endogamy, um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but interracial marriages and how they represent moving toward a shared destiny uh, when you have two different uh, cast members coming together and now you have this uh, mutual understanding or interest uh, because they're tied together in a way that they weren't before. And I think it's not surprising that oftentimes uh, for my white brothers and sisters, 
uh, they're white people who are in interracial relationships or adopt black children or have some significant proximity that ties them to the destiny of the black community often become voices for dismantling white supremacy because they seem to now come to this new phase of understanding of a shared uh, destiny. And I think to repent is to engage in unmasking the caste system and to forgive is to engage in the belief of a shared destiny as equals. And if the caste system remains hidden and unaddressed, then there can be no repentance um, and there's certainly no forgiveness, uh, but it, it can still be love for enemies and all those things. Uh, but I don't know if that uh, is the same thing. So um, I, I just feel like a lot of amazing things were just shared, um, just about just our, our mutuality uh, within healing, a shared destiny, right? Um, I, I appreciated hearing about like, these are the ways we're kind of going about uh, demonstrating our forgiveness, not just as a thought exercise, but as, as something that has legs and walks, right? Uh, and does the work uh, rebuilding homes um, and really um, doing, doing the work of moving past and, and turning towards what God has for us. And so we have a, just about 15 minutes and I, I want to honor that um, and move us into this discussion about reparations, which, which I feel like a lot of our panelists have already started moving us towards, just recognizing that we can't stop the conversation at repentance without talking about forgiveness and that we can't stop the con or move the conversation uh, past repentance and forgiveness without also including a discussion about reparations. Uh, and so, I would love to hear from you all as panelists, uh, you know, a common defini definition just out in the world of reparations is the making of amends for a wrong that someone has done by paying money to or otherwise helping those who have been wrong. Um, I wonder if, uh, I think we've answered in some ways, uh, can repentance and forgiveness exist without reparations? Um, I think Darren just shared with us that no, that's, that's not what can happen. And so I guess my question is, what are the specific reparations that churches need to enact when it comes to the white supremacy ideology that they have been active and complicit in? Um, I can start here. I just jotted a few things. I think um, what Dr. Owens already mentioned is that this will definitely be incomplete and messy. Um, but as I think about the time I've been able to spend uh, with Dr. Taylor, uh, who's my spiritual father and has taught me uh, so much in terms of prayer and silence um, and the importance of, of looking within I think when that is mapped onto the church at large, what we see is the importance of going back um, and allowing the church to truly see itself. And I think Brother Draper was already touching on some of these things, um, but I think for the foundation to move forward in terms of reparation, forgiveness, and repentance, um, after there's some teaching about what reparations is and why it's actually essential for the healing process in communities, because there's misunderstandings on all sides about its importance. I think the second thing that needs to happen is churches need to create committees to research their congregation's history with white supremacy. Uh, be it white flight, be it seed money that is tied to slave labor, uh, be it uh, paternalistic activities, whether it's in missions um, or other ways that we engage uh, with communities or several actions, but just researching ourselves, researching our own history. Uh, we probably have bulletins that go back 70 years. Um, and just going back and trying to, to learn how we've, we've taken part in upholding this system. Um, and then there needs to be research concerning the Church of Christ as a whole. There's already a lot um, that's been done, um, but making that available. Um, 
to give an access to members that are specifically focusing on um, the damage that has been done. Uh, and not just for the, the churches, um, but also for the schools and the Church of Christ structures. All these things need to be brought to light, publicly apologized for, and then conversations concerning reparations, I believe can begin from there. Um, and of course, this should expand out to all the branches of Christianity and surely to America as a whole. Uh, but I think until we have that introspection on um, that time with God on a corporate level that just allows us to look within and see, you know, what have we done and how we, we've harmed each other, um, how there's been harm specifically done um, in this question of race, uh, there, there can't be any progress. And I think that needs to be something that's taken with utmost severity or seriousness um, as the foundation for what it means to move forward. Uh, Darren, I agree with you. Uh, I believe that um, as a, I mean, to, to use the language of, the, of Isabel Wilkerson, for me to be a part of historic dominant caste and to be an oppressor, I can't speak about God as a liberator until I own up to myself being an oppressor. And, and to go to reconciliation worship services and is very thin without reparation and without really deeply understanding. I mean, I think reparation is something that most white people avoid. And on the national scale, it's been written off. Um, but on a local scale, uh, the more I research it in Tulsa and understand it, it helps me to understand how important it is to build in our city. And I think every city, like you said, Darren, every church should look very locally about what has happened there locally and how that can be repaired within local communities. Start there. Um, and I think the national conversation on reparations is important too. And as, as uh, Don McLaughlin said, you know, we've done plenty of reparations and we've had white affirmative action for 500 years. Um, so we know how to do all that for the dominant class. And I, as a white person, am uh, committed to speaking out about this because I think all of us need to be speaking out about it. I love that idea of just starting where you are. What better place to start? I know some of our local disciples churches uh, here in the Des Moines area have actually done what Darren suggested and realized that there was slave labor in building their church buildings and have already collect, started collecting money and sending off um, money to, to black colleges, uh, to uh, different neighborhood associations that were affected at different times. Um, I think a lot of it is, is us as church leaders uh, educating ourselves to what it is that is local and then making that a, the people around us aware of that. And when we bring that to the, the cause and exactly, you know, what it is that we're doing, then you get people on board that are like, I, I will get to that. And so you can continually find these places that need this repar these reparations to where you can be that voice that starts that and then you can sit there and uh, and help to, you know, make sure that there's continual acknowledgement and voice, uh, continual repentance of ways uh, that are going on through your community because people aren't going to just naturally go out and look for that. Um, we need to be that voice for them, showing them where this this is. Um, so that they know where they can uh, then make these changes. Just to add to that, I'm, I'm going, I'm, I want to go back to what Don said, because it, it just really moved me because it, it, it's, it, it's, it's kind of the notion where, where over there in Acts 1, where it says, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, then Judea, and then Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. So it starts in Jerusalem, it starts at home. How do I individually look around me and see how white supremacy is practiced in our society 
every single day. And how do I then begin to speak out in small ways? I love Don's example. I mean, I'm dealing with an establishment that actually does not, is not open or is not practicing what I believe is fair and what's decent. And I just decide, okay, I'm not, I can't continue to give my money to that. Just think if, if Christians did that everywhere, if Christians everywhere, now, let alone the notion of the church, because I think, I think we, this is a church issue. I think it's a Christian issue. I think it's a greater community issue. But I think we start with saying, Lord, help me to be aware of where I can change how I live and benefit from this system of oppression, which I, which I, I and I go back to something Gregory said earlier, I don't think it's something for me to lecture white people on. I, but I do think we start with how do I make an immediate change just becoming conscious and aware and sensitive to how my privilege is active every day in my life and in my church. And how do I then begin to ask my church, hey, hey, we, we, we can't do this. And if we and, and, and we're going to do this, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm at the wrong place. So when, when, when people, everything is driven by supply and demand, when we begin to demand something different, then we get something different supplied to us. If we accept the way things are fundamentally, institutionally, systemically, then we continue to get more of that. We get it in our, our churches, we get it in our colleges and universities, in our schools, in our workplace, in our business places that we, we, we do commerce with every day. And it just stays a part of our society and we pass it on to a generation the next generation coming. Um, and just to add one thing, I think somehow we have to theologically, for lack of better words, um, show that reparations is exciting and not this like drudgery of, oh my goodness, we're gonna lose or whatever the thinking is around it. Uh, because again, if it's in the family context, you're talking about family healing, right? That it's not this, it's family healing and it's something that, that should have been happening. Um, and it's, it's a part of the, the beautiful interaction um, that comes when we're committed to love, right? And, and I think the, the language and the vision around it has to shift so that it is not this feeling of just purging or, or great pain, but of, of great anticipation and excitement of how do we see this um, not as something that we, we should be neglecting or trying to hold off for a man, or they're gonna be asking for this. And if we do this, what else are they gonna be asking for? Whatever it is that, that tends to come with the reparations conversation, uh, but sparks the creativity to the point where we say, man, if this is what we could do here, imagine if we took it and, and did it in this area. And imagine for this community, if they were experiencing that and how much things would change in our communities um, if it wasn't just reparations between uh, white people and black people, but also with our, our Native American brothers and sisters. And it just became this thing that germinated um, because of the excitement for healing and not because solely because of this guilt um, that people are trying to, to shirk, uh, but because we are participating in the healing work of reconciliation and the love of God. Amen. Um, I just wanted to make sure I'm, I'm looking at the panelists. Any last things before we finish up? Okay. Just, all right. Okay. I think, <laughs> I think we're good. I love that idea. What, what if we got excited about reparations? What if we re remember and recognize how uh, much our destinies are, are shared, our fates are entwined, you know, um, when one person heals, the community heals, when the community heals, the individual heals as well, you know, what, what would it be like um, to, to have that type of excitement? And so, um, I really appreciate the panelists uh, for, for sharing, for moving us 
I think through what is a formula uh, for for moving forward, right? For from um, repentance, forgiveness to reparations. I think we just journeyed through that and had some suggestions, concrete as well as kind of more theological and theoretical. And so my hope is that we will all take this, that we will not just allow this to be, you know, a fun conversation, right? But we take this to our homes, we take this uh, to our quiet spaces, we take this to our communities, our churches, and start to do the work too. Um, we are not whole people. We, we've built a, a system that has not just been about the dehuman, dehumanization of people of color, of black folks, um, but it's also been the, the subsequent dehumanization of white people too, as they created the caste, as they figured out nuanced ways to keep it in place um, for the last <clears throat> 400 years, 400 plus years. And so my hope for us and my invitation is for us to become human, uh, to become whole, uh, and to do the work that, that makes sure that not only that our journey um, ends, we hope that it won't end at our own selves becoming whole, but that we really do become excited. We really do understand the benefit uh, that it is that, that everybody becomes human, that everybody becomes whole, and that we're able to move forward in what God uh, has created for us to be and to do in this time and place. So thank you all so much. Um, really grateful for the panelists. And thank you, Dr. Taylor, again, for allowing us to be here. My goodness, thank you so much, Dr. Owen, for, for, for guiding the panelists. Thank you, uh, Dr. Draper, Marty, uh, Aaron, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Greg for your, your work in, in putting this panel together. It was, it was much needed. Um, I told y'all it was, it was going to be an important piece right here. This is an important piece that we have to uh, attack, attach ourselves to in some real ways. Um, I, I, I want us to remember as we come to a close that you can't do the horrifying work of denying somebody else's humanity and think that you won't lose your own. It is not possible for you to destroy another individual and think that you won't crack the very foundation of your soul. And it is because of that that we find ourselves in our current situation and in the current context that we sit in because of the, the denial of humanity and the pathology that has developed from that. Racism is a sickness. It's a sickness. And like any other sickness, it runs rampant until you do something about it. It is a pandemic that, in my opinion, has multiplied and outrivals COVID-19 because it has existed with us so long and we have ignored it like a neglectful administration and continue to see it in our streets day in and day out and think that it will just go away and think that time will heal it and think if we just warm up the hearts, if we uh, keep doing uh, the same action, that something will happen. We have to go to the root of the problem and deconstruct the vile system that racism has created here. And the only way to do that is to do some deep soul work. We have to work at the core of our soul. And so many times we don't want to do that. Because if we get down to that, that, that soul work, we will see our complicity in white supremacy. White people will see their complicity. Black people will see their complicity. And we have to come to terms with that. And so with that thinking, I have just, just two questions. Just two questions 
uh, for us to meditate on. I always, I always like to end with questions. You know, I think those are important. Um, uh, first question is, how do we confess our complicity with white supremacy? How do we begin to confess our complicity with white supremacy? And then the second question is, what do I need to sacrifice to end racism for the cause of Christ? What do I need to sacrifice to end racism for the cause of Christ? I think uh, we have uh, so much information that we need to meditate on and reflect on from today, but this uh, should push us, right? This level of awareness should push us to a level of inquiry where we start to ask more questions and dig deeper, right? Um, and this level of awareness should also push us to empathy and not just any type of empathy, but the type of empathy that Carl Batson talks about this empathetic concern, this level of empathy that moves us to action. It's the difference of um, driving past a car accident and just keep driving and saying, I hope everybody is okay, but it's empathy that moves us to actually pull over and make sure everybody's okay, right? It, it, it moves us to action. And this empathy that we should get from this space today should move us to action. And it's in that action that work is being done to heal our community, to heal our nation. Thank everybody for being here today. I wanna to toss it over to Dr. Taylor for last words. Thank you, Byron. And uh, thank you to all of the uh, presenters and participants and panel leaders and panelists for the tremendous work that you've done today. This is necessary work. Um, we're loving God with the mind, the heart, soul, and the physical strength, physical energy, uh, physical endurance. And we have to commit our entire being to this problem because this is a problem that impacts our entire being. And if we don't spend time in sessions like this, uh, we will see more people spending time in the streets and um, if we don't talk through these kinds of issues, uh, I always say when we stop talking, we start uh, addressing this matter through other means. And our prayer is that we never come to that, but it's gonna take us enduring sound teaching and to endure it and listening to it and giving our hearts in an open way to receiving truth and light. I want to say to Dr. Pointer and to the Central uh, Minneapolis Church of Christ, thank you for hosting this event. And I want to clarify uh, that this event uh, is similar to the convening of people from all walks of life uh, to address a common problem that affects us all. And we are, we're grateful to the Minneapolis Church and Dr. Pointer for hosting uh, this event uh, that was conducted and, and put together by the Carl Spain Center on Race Studies and Spiritual Action. So we appreciate uh, your hospitality uh, and we do trust that we'll continue on uh, in this work to the next phase. I want to encourage us to pray, um, standing on our feet as well as on our knees and in any posture that you can think of uh, for uh, the upcoming election on November 3rd. We don't know what will happen on that day and what will happen after that day, uh, but we need to be vigilant and prayerful in our spirits that we can be prepared uh, to be agents of, uh, of continued uh, seeking to be at peace with each other uh, and not uh, seeking to destroy each other emotionally, psychologically, or even physically. There are some in our country that are already prepared uh, to carry out violence. Uh, that has been reported from many sources. And we need to be aware of that, that this is a dangerous moment. This is not just about talking or rhetoric. Uh, we are in a very dangerous moment as a nation and we cannot um, 
act as if things are going in the normal way that we have be become accustomed to them going, we are at a very serious hour of crisis. And so I want to uh, say to everybody that's still on, on the, uh, the Zoom meeting, thank you uh, for sticking it out. And, um, and <laughs> this is a God-sized job, but God needs people in order to carry out his work. So let's stay available to him and stay prayed up in his spirit and ready for spiritual action, action that's rooted in the life of God's spirit. And I know that he'll give us the wisdom and the wherewithal to do whatever we can to bring more light uh, in the midst of a country that is becoming more and more filled with night. So we need day and not night. So thank you again, God bless you and uh, go in peace. And I'll turn it back over to Byron to give us our closing prayer and then we'll be gone. Would you pray with me, please? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this time just lifting up our, our time today. Thank you for being a God that uh, sees past our imperfections and our hangups and our fallacies, and you still love us. Lord, teach us to love like you love. Teach us to uh, be in this space, in this world that sometimes doesn't love us, that sometimes uh, we do harm against others. Teach us uh, how to be more like you. Give us the courage to be in the midst of the worldliness and still be a light that shows up like you would. We beg that you come and, and guide our footsteps and, and got, order our steps that we can uh, work uh, in concert with your spirit to heal this world that we're in, Lord. And we pray that with everything in our being, that we'll give everything we have to you and allow you to guide it for us. All these things we ask in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Y'all be blessed and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs>